Wonderful. Okay, good evening. Uh, nice to have all of you here. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, what I hope is going to be a really uh, um, engaging, um, almost an incredibly uh, substantial uh, uh, opportunity of study. Um, I was uh, just reflecting just before this that I almost don't know that I would have taught this class in an in-person um, forum. Um, but it's actually, I think, really perfect for this type of setting where people can be at home, people can kind of, um, you know, we can limit the class in terms of the length of time that, that we're on it. Um, and it really kind of gives us the opportunity to kind of go uh, into a text um, that as far as I imagine has, has never been studied before. Um, that this is a text that some people have read before, maybe, um, but probably not in, you know, in a, well over a hundred years. Um, and I certainly don't know that whether it's ever a work that people have kind of really gone into in a, uh, in a substantial way. Um, and so I'm really excited to be uh, studying it with you. Um, it's a work that I've come across um, as part of some classes that I taught in the synagogue a few years ago um, about uh, different women in the community. Um, and it's actually become a uh, kind of a core element in my uh, PhD work as well. Um, and uh, the more time I spend with this work and with, with the author, the more that it kind of, I keep getting into more and more and it kind of uh, has been leading me in some really interesting um, directions. So I hope that some of that will come out in the class. Um, today's class is really gonna be somewhat of an introduction. We're gonna look at the preface uh, of the work. We're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, author um, a little bit about the, uh, the era in which it was written um, and try to really set the stage for what will be um, our study as we go forward uh, in, the, uh, in future weeks. Um, and uh, what's nice about this text is that it's available for free online. Um, uh, for those that didn't uh, get the link, um, let me share it with you now. So anybody that wants you can open it up. But what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to I'll ultimately share my screen so that you can have it that way too. But I'll just make sure that you all have it as well. Okay. And so here I'm just posting it in the uh, in here. So now everyone, that's the link to the um, to the to the text. Um, now the text that we're going to look at was uh, was published in 1856, so you know, about uh, you know nearly two uh, two centuries ago. Um, and what's great about it in terms of our opportunity to study it is that it was written in English, um, and so it doesn't require any uh, language skills um, outside of English in order to um, in order to access it. Um, and what's special about it, kind of coming from our community is that the author, whose name was Miriam Mendez Belisario, was a member of Bevis Mark Synagogue, right? This is the synagogue she attended. She lived um, uh, very close to uh, the synagogue, just kind of past where Liverpool Street Station is uh, today. Um, and so this was her, you know, the synagogue that she grew up in and that she attended. Um, and she had close relationship with uh, the different ministers of the community. We know she had a relationship with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, David Aaron de Sola, who was the Chazan, uh, with uh, Sabata Morais, who was here for five years before going on to be the minister in Philadelphia. She had a relationship with uh, David Meldela, who was the kind of the senior rabbi of the community. Um, at that time, his father had been the Chacham, Rafael Meldela. Uh, she was on good terms with Abraham de Sola, who was the son of David Aaron de Sola, who eventually went to become the minister in the Spanish and Portuguese community in Montreal. Um, and so she, she really was part of the community. She knew all the people in the community. Um, and that allows this text, I think, have a particular resonance for, our, uh, for us to study because it kind of came out of our, uh, out of our synagogue. So let's take a look. I'm going to uh, share my screen with you now so that we can take a look at the um, at the uh, at the text okay great so can everyone see the the text now yeah great okay good so let us 
Um, take a look at this. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the work in front of you now? Can I get a thumbs up? Can, can you guys see this? Yes. Okay, great. Good. Okay, good. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this then. So what I have in front of you is the, um, is the title page of the book. You can see that it's called Sabbath Evenings at Home. Um, the reason it's called Sabbath Evenings at Home is that the work um, was written in order to be a, uh, something that families, families perhaps, or maybe even schools, but families would, could perhaps study at home. But at the very least, the, uh, the, the, the book itself is essentially a book of conversations. Um, what she does is she lays out the book. It's a, it's a, it's a series of 24 conversations, and the conversations happen between an aunt and her niece and nephew on Friday nights. Um, as we'll see in the book, the setting is that the children have come to live with their aunt for a year while the parents have gone overseas. And every Friday night, they study with their aunt um, by asking her different questions about Judaism. Um, and so the, the, the style of the book is kind of questions and answers and comments and, and so on, but it's laid out as this, in this conversation uh, style, which it, the idea behind doing that was that it should be uh, more engaging to read, that it shouldn't simply be a textbook that you just kind of read of facts and kind of this is, you know, this belief, this is this law, this is this rule, but it's meant to be kind of a bit more engaging by being in a conversation. Um, in fact, you can see that over here that it's, a, it's called Sabbath Evenings at Home, but the second kind of title for it is Familiar Conversations on the Jewish Religion, Its Spirit, and Observances. Okay, so here, I'll try to make the screen a little bit bigger. Let me see if I can do that. Okay, so there it's a little bit bigger. Okay, so familiar conversations, right? So it's conversations on the Jewish religion, its spirit, and observances. So it's going to talk about all of those kinds of things. It's going to talk about the Jewish religion in general, but it's going to talk about issues of Jewish faith, the 13 principles of faith, of Maimonides. Uh, it's going to talk about the Ten Commandments. It's going to talk about the, the laws of the holidays. It's going to talk about customs. Um, and so in that way, it's a really uh, uh, kind of um, far-reaching book. The book is almost a, you would almost say it's like an introduction to Judaism um, for, uh, for, for, for young people that would be, that would be reading it. Um, but of course, it goes beyond just kind of an introduction to Judaism because she, she addresses in, in, in kind of great detail particular issues that were clearly issues of her day. Um, she goes into a lot of detail about issues of the belief in the oral law as opposed to just the written law. So the oral law, uh, meaning the Talmud, uh, particularly in the context of uh, Reform Judaism, um, which had started in the 1840s. So about 10, 15 years before she writes this book, their separate Reform congregation had been founded in London. And so she gets into kind of the question of, you know, you know, whether she <laughs> believe, disagrees with, uh, with their approach, the way that they understand Judaism. Um, she talks a lot about uh, the truth of Judaism in contrast to Christianity, actually. Um, and so missionary activity was a concern uh, when she was writing this book. Um, and really kind of broadly is just trying to get people engaged in, uh, in Jewish life. Um, which was clearly a broader problem happening within the Jewish community at that time, where people were less uh, active, less kind of uh, engaged with their Judaism. Um, and she's trying to kind of get people to be uh, more invested in that. Um, now, what else you can, we'll, we'll talk about that some more as we go on, but something else you can just see from the title page um, is it also talks about that she's the author of another book. So here she's Mary Mendes Belsario, author of uh, and he called Meir Ayin B'nei Ni'urim, which means to make see the eyes of the children, uh, which was a Hebrew and English vocabulary from a selection of the daily prayers. And so this was a work that she published back in 1848, so eight years prior, which essentially was a, uh, a, a 
a book that one could use to learn the translations of the prayers, kind of a word by word translation of the prayers. And the idea was that one would use that method in order to develop their Hebrew skills, um, which again was because there would have been this sense that people aren't gonna enjoy going to synagogue if they don't understand what they're saying. And so she wants to make that, uh, to make sure that children can understand Hebrew. And so she had created a manual for that. Um, one of the reasons that she was so interested in, in these works is that she had actually taught in a uh, Jewish school. Um, it was what called these kind of private Jewish schools. Um, it was run by her aunt and then her cousins, uh, the Belisario sisters. Um, so these are her, her father's brother's daughter, wife and daughters. Um, and so she had taught in that school. And so she had been exposed, right, to the needs of education. Um, and so that was one of the things that probably inspired her to originally write this, this, this book to help people learn Hebrew, but eventually to write this book to help educate people about Judaism. Um, the next part I'll just mention over here, it says revised by the Reverend David Aaron DeSola. So he was the minister of Bevis Mark Synagogue uh, at that time. And so she had, uh, uh, according to what she writes here, right, she had submitted the work uh, to him to, to review um, before, before publishing it. So again, it speaks to the relationship that she had with him. Um, and then the next part over here is she quotes a verse uh, and the verse says the following. Maybe I'll try to make it a little bit larger so that everyone can see it more easily. Okay, so here it says, Chanoch lenar al darko. So one should educate a child, a lad, according to his way, gam ki yaskin lo yasur menu so that it will be that when he becomes old, he will not deviate from it. And so this verse has often been used to say that when one engages in education, right, one has, it's not something which is static, right, but you have to educate to the child, right, and to the kind of where the child is at. Um, and so if perhaps at one time it would have been possible to, uh, uh, if perhaps at one point it would have been possible for, uh, for the children to learn in one way. She said, well, nowadays, in order to learn, they need to learn in a way which is more engaging, which is more interesting, more conversational, right? That's the way children learn nowadays. And so she wrote a new style of book because she felt that that was what was gonna be necessary uh, for children um, during that age, during that age, right? So she kind of puts that right at the front that her book is essentially an innovation, right? And the reason she's doing it is because that's what the times require. Um, and then finally, at the bottom over here, obviously you've published in London um, in 1856. Okay, so that's kind of like her general kind of welcome to, uh, to, this, particular, uh, to this particular book. Okay. Now, let's take a look at this next page over here. Okay, so here we are on to the next page where she's going to make her dedication page. Uh, and her dedication page is to her sole surviving parent, her beloved mother. So her father had died just a few years before. Um, and now she's dedicating this book to her mother. Um, and she writes to her beloved mother, whom she fervently prays may be spared for her many years. This little work is affectionately inscribed by her dutiful child, the author. Um, and so one of the things she's describing here is the reality that her father has unfortunately passed away. And in fact, she's become the primary caregiver for her mother. So I know from some letters that she wrote to some other people that essentially she had stopped being able to teach in the school, in her cousin's school, because she had to care for her mother. So it's almost that in lieu of teaching in the school, she's writing this book now to kind of educate children more broadly. Um, and there may be the added element here that she also needs to make money, meaning her, she, you know, her father's no longer living, someone has to provide for the family, so there may have been a component as well that she's making this book in order to sell copies, in order to make a revenue, 
and again, I know from letters that she wrote that, that I've found in different archives that she worked really hard to, um, to market her book. Um, she marketed it in, in London through the Jewish Chronicle, um, but also in America through the uh, newspaper that was popular at the time there by the uh, reverend in, in uh, Philadelphia, Isaac Leeser. He had a, a Jewish newspaper called The Occident, um, and she also marketed it um, through his paper as well. And so part of it may have been that she also had a financial um, interest in publishing a book because she needed to provide for her family as well. Okay, so that's that so far. Let me um, uh, go back to uh, go off of the share for a second. Okay, and I'm going to just unmute and see if anyone has any questions. Chris, did you have a question? Yes, um, is this um, lady whose surname is Belisario any connection with the, the artist? Yes, so yeah, so basically that's her first cousin. So I mentioned that her, she had been teaching in the school that was being run by her cousins. So it was written by these girls. Their brother was Isaac Mendes Belisario, who was the painter who made the first drawing of the interior of the Smart Synagogue. So yeah, so exactly. So, so that's the connection to the family. A bit more about them, her grandfather, so the, her grandfather and Isaac Mendes' grandfather was also Isaac Mendes Belisario. Um, and he had been a rabbi in the community, teaching in the community school. So essentially there were different schools. There was the, the community school, which was usually for the poor. Um, so it was kind of the poor school. And so you attended that um, if you were maybe from kind of the, the poorer classes. And then there were like these private schools that kind of these, these groups of ladies would often run that was essentially for the more upper class in society that you know, had more of these private education. So her grandfather taught in the community school, but they were teaching, were, had started this private school. Yeah. And any other questions so far? Well, if I may, I have a very, uh, a very simple one since uh, I am uh, connected from Italy. Uh, I asked the, the permission on, on uh, your message on Facebook, but then I, uh, it was, uh, of course, already the time of the meeting. I hope that is not a problem. I studied at West Lon with London Synagogue, and uh, I am a fan of your uh, Shirim. I, I wonder if she was of, or of Italian origins, uh, since the, the surname Belisario, or... Um, it's a good question. I actually, I have a book on the family, but I don't remember. I forget what the family's like exact trajectory. Obviously, originally they had been Portuguese. They had been uh, conversos in Portugal. Whether they spent time after Portugal and Italy before going eventually to London, I'm not sure. I forget the exact uh, route that the family took. That is, po that is actually possible, uh, probab probably uh, the case because in, in Northern Italy, uh, Belisario is uh, uh, quite a uh, uh, common surname. So probably it comes from the Jews of Portugal when they escaped. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yes, Thank you, Rabbi. Welcome. Pleasure. Yes. Right. And then um, Stuart, yes. Just, just an observation, the printer is in 4th Street, which is where the entrance to the Barbican Centre is today. <laughs> so it's also very local to where she lived. Excellent. So yeah, no, it's funny when you read this stuff. I mean, it's, it's all really local. I mean, it's really quite uh, it's exciting. Awesome. So you really can picture, you know, the different places that, that, that pop up. Okay, any, any other questions? Great. So let's, let's go on. I want to now with the next, you know, kind of 10, 15 minutes, jump into the preface of the work um, itself. So I'm going to go back to the share page. So what we see over here, um, turning to the next page, is the list of subscribers. So the way that, that, that publications work back then is that you'd have people subscribe in advance of the work. That would kind of bring in uh, an initial uh, cash flow, which would allow you to publish uh, the book. Um, here you can see Dr. Adler who is the chief rabbi of the Ashkenazi community, um, was on here. Uh, Sir Moses Montefiore ordered 50 copies of the work, um, which probably meant that was going to the community school. So that was probably going to the, the, the school that was run by the synagogue 
uh, itself, um, because the school in Manchester had ordered 12 copies. Um, and then turning to the next page, um, you can see some of the other people who uh, the Rothschilds ordered from it. Reverend DeSolo ordered a copy. Um, and so definitely people of the community. And this one's great. In St. Thomas, you can see this major wolf ordered 25 copies. So that's probably for the school um, in the Spanish and Portuguese community uh, on that island in the Caribbean. Um, but let's take a look at the uh, opening lines. They're just, two, they're just this page and the page after. So we'll be, uh, we'll be able to um, do that in the next few minutes. So she writes the following. And here we'll start to get a sense of kind of how she, kind of how this book came together. And she writes the following. She says, the vital importance of acquiring an intimate knowledge and appreciation of the, integral, of the integral principles of the holy faith of Israel is so generally recognized among its, amongst its members as affording the only means of enabling them to perform conscientiously the several duties it prescribes. Right, so she says, <laughs> it's Victorian language, so you kind of have to read these things sometimes a few times. But basically she's saying, everybody knows that if you want people to engage in the religion, they have to understand the principles that stand behind it, right? That as a necessary consequence, it naturally follows that no effort, however humble or insignificant, should be withheld if in any way calculated to elucidate the same. And therefore, clearly we have to invest in bringing those principles to the fore because again, as she said, everyone agrees you can't engage in religion if you don't know the principles. So we obviously have to invest in making sure people know those very principles. Right, and which is, she's essentially laying out, everyone agrees that that's something really valuable to do. And so she continues, acting upon these premises, right, based on this idea, the author of this little work, meaning herself, she often refers to it as this little work in her letters as well, even though it's over 300 pages, right? So the author of this little work trusts that her earnest sin sincerity of purpose will plead in extenuation of the presumption of obtruding herself on the notice of her co-religionist, right? She's, she's saying, because I'm so sincere, forgive the fact that I'm like, who am I to, to put this book into the public sphere? But judging that the unprejudiced feelings of youth will more readily yield themselves to the powerful influence of truth when presented under a garb less stern than the direct lesson, she has much gratification devoted her time and consideration to the inspiring task of explaining the spirit and observances of Judaism in a series of familiar conversations, right? So she says what she's done is she's put this together because she realized that children can't necessarily learn through direct lessons, that they learn better through stories, right? Through telling stories. And so that's what's driven her to um, put these familiar conversations uh, together. Continuing, such as she trusts will sufficiently interest her young brothers and sisters in Israel, right? So she hopes that through this system, it will get everyone really kind of invested in um, learning. They'll become really excited about their Judaism. Not that it will end there, but as to induce them to seek afterwards with renewed zeal for more elaborate information from the many valuable stores, both of ancient and modern Hebrew literature extent, right? So she's saying she hopes that this will just be a stepping ground, that you'll read this book, that you're going to read this book and you're gonna be so excited, you know, engaged by what you do that you're then gonna take the next level to read more advanced texts uh, as well. Um, but be that as it may, the text itself is fantastic, as you'll see as we, uh, as we go through it. Um, she continues, it may and will possibly be objected that the quotations from scripture are too copious in proportion to the amount of argument and that references might serve the same purpose. So here she raises just kind of the, this issue that some people might not like the fact that she quotes a lot of biblical verse uh, in this text and doesn't simply say, you know, oh, you should believe in God as it says in that verse, but she then quotes all the verses. Um, but she says, even though some people might want to say she shouldn't have quoted all of the verses, she's not going to tell you why she did that. Um, and it's important because we'll see a lot of biblical verse during, during, the, during the reading. She says, to this, um, 
She says, to this, the author would reply that the subject being one of no ordinary interest and of so sacred a nature, her chief aim has been to impress each individual point of faith clearly on the minds of her youthful readers, to effect which a connection, a connecting link of opposite illustration appeared to hold forth the surest promise of success. Right, she said, I had to show you the sources in order that I would succeed in my efforts, right? Um, as references are not always attended to at the time, right? People maybe don't look up references if you simply reference, and if sought out later, lose their effect from the inevitable disconnections of ideas that has arisen since the discussion of this topic that necessitated them, right? And so what she essentially says is that people are not, aren't gonna look up the references. So I decided I would just put them all there, that you just read all the, the verses as, I, as we engage in these different arguments. Okay, fine. We'll see that more when we get into the work. Um, but this is the last part I want to look at with you, because here she talks about how she came to write the book practically. How did she write it? One of the things that's so interesting about it is that it's a female author, right? Which today maybe wouldn't strike us as so strange um, to have a woman writing a book about Judaism. Um, but at that time, uh, it possibly could have been uh, a somewhat unusual. Um, and perhaps ahead of her time. Um, there was someone else in the community who also wrote books on Judaism, and that, her name was Grace Aguilar, who was a well-known Jewish author. Um, so you start finding some Jewish women that are becoming you know, highly educated in Judaism and putting forward works. So, but the question is, is what, what did she learn from? How did she come to amass this knowledge that would enable her to write this original work? And that's what she explains here. And here again, talking about herself, she says, she embraces this opportunity of publicly acknowledging the very valuable assistance she has derived from the whole series of Mr. Leeser's religious works, right? So here she refers to the minister in Philadelphia, who I said had also had a Jewish newspaper there, Isaac Leeser, who had published some books on Judaism, translations of German works, um, and had also published a series of sermons that he had given over 10, 15 year period on a whole series of Jewish topics. So she says, for one thing, that work was, uh, was, incredibly, uh, was incredibly helpful, um, which, it, which she says, which have studied progressively, forming themselves a compendium of Jewish principles and aspirations, such as cannot be too highly esteemed. So that's one is Isaac Leeser's books. Two, she is also greatly indebted to the writings of Reverend David Aaron de Sola. So here she refers to the writings of de Sola. What had de Sola done? De Sola had translated the prayer books into English. He had started to translate uh, the Torah into English, and he'd also translated the Mishnah into English as well. So he had engaged in a number of translations. And to Mr. Moses Makadas, who was a member of the community, uh, very able translation of Chizuk Emuna, Faith Strengthened. Chizuk Emuna was a work from the 16th century uh, that, was, uh, that had been written in Hebrew, which was a polemic against Christianity. Um, and Makada had recently translated that into English here in London. And so she had read that as well, which furnished her with a lot of what she knew about Judaism's arguments with Christianity. And she continues, in fact, she does not hesitate to confess having drawn the honey from every blossom, her object being not to enhance the merit of what can only be regarded as a compilation, right? She says her book is essentially a compilation, right? But to avail herself of every clue that may lead her young co-religionists more directly and securely to the fountain of living waters, right? A reference to the Mayan uh, Hasho Eva, right, to the, the wellsprings of knowledge of the Torah, right? So she says she's not right, she's essentially putting a compendium. She's taking different things that other people have translated or have written, and she's taking that knowledge and reframing it into a conversation to make it more uh, uh, enjoyable to learn, more accessible for young readers. And so she continues, and this with concludes, should the familiar tone of this little work conduce to this happy result by rendering the doctrinal lessons a heart-stirring subject of interest, she will feel amply compensated for having introduced to their notice a home friend, whom she trusts will be found to avow no other sentiments 
then such has become a daughter of Israel, June 1856, right? And so what she essentially says over here, she hopes that she succeeds, right? Simply to help inspire uh, young, young minds. And so here she kind of lays out what her work is, right? That she, she gained this knowledge, not by studying Talmud in its original, not by kind of reading all these classic texts, but by through reading the translations of some of those within her, the decade of when she wrote this. And she used that to get kind of all of the, the, the content of her work. And then she took that content and reframed it into conversations. And as you'll see, she brings anecdotes and stories and makes it in, uh, into work that becomes uh, really readable. Um, personally, I had a lot of fun reading, reading her book. Um, and what I'd like to do is she sets it out into 24 conversations. The conversations are kind of uh, broken into different subjects. And so what I'd like to do is each week is we'll look at one of those conversations. Um, now, everybody has the text available to them now. What I'd like to suggest is that every week before we meet, right, so you have a whole week to do it, read, read that week's conversation. Um, and then when we get together, you know, I'll be able to just kind of give a synopsis of what the chat, the conversation is about, but then we'll just look at a few specific points um, of interest in those conversations. Sometimes we'll be looking at just to talk about the, the idea that she's putting forward or the, or, the, or the ruling that she addresses. But sometimes we'll talk about historic context, what's happening you know, in the 1850s when she's writing this. Uh, maybe we'll talk about some of the other works that she sources. So we'll do some historic contextualization as well, in addition to just understanding the content of what she's writing too. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to come with questions as well from having read uh, the conversation too, and we'll be able to really have a uh, an, a meaningful uh, study of of her work. Um, I'm going to unmute you just to see if anybody has any uh, final questions or thoughts. Okay, great. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to conclude now. Just say thank you guys so much for being here. Um, future classes, like I said, 40 minutes tops, um, and it's it's a fascinating work. It's a really enjoyable study just in of itself. Um, when people come to me learning about Judaism, I often recommend for them to read uh, Miriam's book. I find that, you know, what she's writing about in the middle of the 19th century really is relevant to our days. A lot of the issues that she talks about are literally the same issues that we're debating about, that we're talking about nowadays as well. Um, when she wrote this, it was really the beginning of what we would call the modern era. And so uh, kind of a lot of the um, sensibilities and sensitivities and kind of issues about traditional Judaism and modern life that, that, that we experience today and, and perhaps at times, you know, struggle with or think about already at her time or beginning at her time is when people began to think about those things. So it's really, we're, we're stepping back into a moment in time, but you really feel that the things she's talking about, this book could have been written, you know, last year as well. Maybe just some of the anecdotes would have been uh, would have been slightly different. So I think it's going to be a really um, uh, enjoyable uh, read for all of us. Um, again, I would recommend that you read each conversation each week. Even if you don't read it, come to the class anyway. We'll still uh, we'll be talking about the different ideas. Um, but if you want to get even more out of it, try try your best to uh, to read the conversation in uh, advance. Yes, Chris. Yes. Can I ask you? Is there any way of downloading uploading this book yeah you can so oh, on the, the link, uh, if you follow the link that i sent you so yeah. if you look on that page you that. scroll down there's a um a thing you can do for like to get the pdf version of it and you can download it and you could even print it out um if you want uh as well um, well actually i can share the page again i can show everyone exactly where it is so here we are back on the um back on the page so if you go down below over here so here it says PDF. Ah, right. right. Yes. Click yes. on that. That will allow you to download well, it onto your, onto your hard drive. Great. Okay, everyone. It's been a real pleasure Thank studying you. with you. Uh, have a wonderful night.